Hi, welcome back to our income taxation lecture. We're just going to continue from where we stopped last time. So now, we will start by discussing non-resident aliens not engaged in trade or business in the Philippines. So for their net income tax, non-resident aliens not engaged in trade or business shall be liable for the entire income he received from all sources within the Philippines by way of the gross income tax. So the tax rate is 25% on gross income. For their final income tax, sale of shares of stock or sale of real property which are capital assets use tax rate in the next section which is 50% final income tax. For aliens employed by MNCs, OBUS and Petroleum Service Contractors, their income tax liability for salaries and compensation. These alien individuals are liable for final income tax at the rate of 15% on their gross income. Same tax treatment is applicable to Filipinos employed and occupying the same position as the aliens employed therein. The 15% final income tax does not apply to R and F employees. So, both aliens and Filipinos. For their income tax liability for other income, it would depend upon the taxpayer's classification or status. Let's go now to tax on corporations. Let us first discuss about domestic corporations. So, in general, a domestic corporation is generally liable for net income tax because the NIRC says taxable income. The net income is imposed at a rate of 35% on all income derived from sources within and without the Philippines. For their optional corporate income tax, the tax rate is 15% and it is immaterial since the president has not yet implemented this option. For proprietary educational institutions and hospitals, they are liable for net income tax at a rate of only 10% provided that it must be a stock and non-profit institution. It must be a private educational institution or hospital. Their gross income from unrelated activity does not exceed 50% and they must have been issued a permit to operate from the government. You have to take note that non-stock and non-profit educational institutions are exempt from income tax. For GOCCs, agencies, or instrumentalities, the 35% net income tax rate is applicable to all GOCCs except the following SSS, PhilHealth, PCSO, GSIS. For final income tax, the interest from deposits and yield from deposit substitutes and from trust funds and similar arrangements and royalties from sources within the Philippines are subject to 20% final income tax. If these are derived from sources without, they shall be subject to the net income tax and not the final income tax. Capital gains from the sale of shares of stock not traded in the stock exchange. You have to apply, uh, apply rules on individuals. The tax on income derived under the expanded foreign currency deposit system. The depository bank is the income earner and the subject and is subject to the net income tax of 35%. However, when the depository bank under the system transacts with the following, its income is exempt from net income tax. Non-residents, Offshore banking units, local commercial banks, branches of foreign banks authorized by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, and other depository banks under the system. With regard to foreign loans, okay, income derived there therefrom shall be subject to a final tax at the rate of ten percent. Okay, intercorporate dividends. The domestic corporation is the stockholder of another domestic corporation. Being a stockholder, it is entitled to dividends. The dividends received by it shall not be subject to tax, in other words, exempt. For the capital gains realized from the sale, exchange, or disposition of lands and or buildings, you have to apply final income tax rate of 
which is imposed on the grain presumed to have been realized. For resident foreign corporations in general, on the other hand, like a domestic corporation, a resident foreign corporation is subject to the net income tax at the rate of 35%. However, unlike a domestic corporation, a resident foreign corporation is only liable for income derived by it from sources within the Philippines only. Unlike the uh, no, unlike for the domestic corporation, they are liable for income derived from sources within and without the Philippines. Dito sa resident foreign corporations, they're liable only for their income derived within the Philippines uh, or derived from sources within the Philippines. For their optional corporate income tax, 15% ang tax rate sa gross income. For the MCIT, compare the 2% of gross income versus net income and you have to choose the higher of the two. International carrier doing business in the Philippines, okay, liable to pay tax of 2.5% on its gross uh, Philippine billings. For international air carriers, the following requisites must be present. The person's excess baggage, cargo, and the mail must be originating in the Philippines in a continuous and uninterrupted flight or shipment, and irrespective of the place of the sale or issue and the place of payment of the ticket. For international shipping carriers, the following are the prerequisites. It must originate from the Philippines. It must be up to the final destination and regardless of the place of the sale or payment of the passenger freight documents. Offshore banking units. A final income tax at the rate of 10% is imposed on income derived by offshore banking units authorized by the Banco Central and Pilipinas from its foreign currency transactions. Example given are branches of commercial banks. Transactions of these OBUs are exempt from final income tax provided it is with the following. Non-residents, other OBUs, local commercial banks, and branches of foreign banks. Tax on branch profit remittance. A 15% final income tax based on the total profits applied or earmarked for remittance is imposed on any profit remitted by a branch to its head office. If a profit remitted nor from activities connected with the, with the conduct of its business in the Philippines, the net income tax rate of 35% shall apply. This tax does not apply to local subsidiaries of foreign corporations for branch offices only regional area headquarters and regional operating headquarters of mncs okay for regional area headquarters a branch established in the philippines by mnc and which um headquarters do not earn or derive income from the philippines and which acts supervisory communications and coordinating center for their affiliate subsidiaries or branches in the Asia Pacific regions and other foreign markets tax on corporations okay ito yung ROH or the regional operating headquarters okay regional operating headquarters a branch established in the Philippines by MNCs which are engaged in any of the following general administration and planning business planning and coordination sourcing and procurement of raw materials and components corporate finance advisory services marketing and control and sales promotion training and personal management logistic services r d product and develop product development technical support and maintenance data processing and communication and business development for regional area headquarter, they are exempt from income tax while the regional operating headquarter is subject to net income tax of 15%. Okay. Take note of the last one. So for final income tax, 
The interest income and royalties are subject to 20% um, 20 final income tax. There are income derived from expanded foreign currency deposit system and the income earner is a resident foreign corporation depository bank and the tax rate is 35%. The intercorporate um, dividends, the income received by the foreign corporation from the domestic corporation shall be exempt from income tax. For non-resident foreign corporations in general, they are liable for gross income tax rate of 35% on income derived from sources within the Philippines only. Uh, for their interest on foreign loans, a final withholding tax at the rate of 20% um, I mean, is imposed on the amount of interest on foreign loans. Contemplated transaction here is one where the lender is a non-resident foreign corporation and the borrower is a domestic corporation. The exemption applies only when the lender is a foreign government or any of the GFI international regional financial institutions. So, for intercorporate dividends, among the three corporate taxpayers, only the non-resident foreign corporation is liable for dividends received by it from a domestic corporation at the rate of 35%. Tax deemed paid credit rule. So the tax is pairing rule. The country of domicile of the non-resident foreign corporation allows a tax credit of 25 um a tax credit of 20% for taxes deemed paid in the Philippines to be entitled to the lower rate of 15%. For the capital gains tax from the sale of shares not traded in the stock exchange, the rules on individuals apply. Okay, punta naman tayo ng minimum corporate income tax. Okay, so this tax is imposed on two types of corporations, the domestic corporation and the resident foreign corporation. This is to discourage these corporations from claiming too many deductions to avoid payment of tax. So, the minimum corporate income tax of 2% of the gross income is imposed in lieu of the net income tax of 35%. So, ano ang imposition? Paano ini-impose ang tax na to? So, the 2% MCIT cannot be imposed simultaneously with the net income tax of 35%. So, compare nyo itong dalawang to, tapos piliin nyo yung mas mataas. Kaya sabing impose whichever is higher. Yung 2% MCIT ba? Yung may yield nyo? Ano mas mataas? 2% MCIT ba? Or yung 35% net income tax? So, the MCIT can be imposed only at the beginning of the fourth taxable year, immediately following the year in which the corporation commence its operations. So, sa fourth taxable year, pa siya pwedeng i-impose. Alright. So, this is a sample computation on how you will be able to yield the minimum corporate income tax. So here, XYZ is a domestic corporation in its 10th year of business. The following is the company's income statement for the current taxable year. So its net sales is 100 million. Yung cost of sales nila ay 20 million. So you have to subs um you have to subtract the cost of sales from the net sales so 100 million less 20 million is equal to 80 million now 80 million is the gross income of xyz corporation less its itemized deductions amounting to 75 million so again subtract the itemized deductions from the gross income then you will yield 5 million as the taxable income so based on the above um, example the regular corporate income tax shall be 1 million 500,000 pesos how did we get 1 million 500,000 pesos so you have to Multiply the taxable income, which is 5 million, by 0.3 or 30%. So, 5 million times 0 0.3 is equal to 1,500,000. 1,500,000 
while the minimum corporate income tax shall be 1,600,000 pesos. How did we get that? Okay, the 80 million, which is the gross income multiplied by 0.02%. Kasi sabi nga natin, 2% lang ang MCIT. So, 80 million multiplied by 2% is equal to 1,600,000 pesos. So, which is higher? 1,500,000 pesos? Uh, 1,500,000 pesos or 1,600,000 pesos? Of course, mas mataas yung 1,600,000 pesos. Therefore, the company shall pay the higher income tax, which is the minimum corporate income tax amounting to 1,600,000 pesos for the current year. Now, when does a corporation start to be covered by MCIT again? A company is liable for MCIT starting the fourth year, immediately following the year in which it commenced its operations. Meaning, if the company started operating in 2016, regardless of the month, it will be liable for MCIT provided it is higher than the regular corporate income tax starting 2020, which is the fourth year from 2017. The year following the year, in which it commenced operations. Now, the MCIT does not apply to non-resident foreign corporations. However, resident foreign corporations are also liable for MCIT under Section 28, Paragraph A, okay, Subparagraph 2 of the Tax Code. So, the carry forward if excess minimum tax. Okay. This is the second carryover tax under the NIRC. The first is the NOLCO or the Net Operation Loss Carryover. Okay. Any excess of the MCIT over the net income shall be carried forward and credited against the net income tax over the net income tax and shall be carried forward and credited against the net income tax for the three immediately succeeding taxable years. Unlike the NOLCO, the MCIT can be carried over for the three immediately succeeding years. So, for the carry forward provision of the MCIT, here's an example. Okay, for year one of XYZ Corporation, its gross sales is 1 million pesos. The sales, returns, and allowance is 100,000 pesos. 100,000 pesos should be subtracted from the gross sales. So, the net sales is 900,000 pesos. Cost sales is 130,000 pesos. Again, you have to subtract the cost of sales, which is 130,000 pesos, from the net sales, which is 900,000 pesos, and you will get 770,000 pesos as the gross income. Okay, For the operating expenses, they had 450,000 pesos. O, less nyo na naman yung 450,000 pesos from the gross income. And you will get 320,000 pesos as the net taxable income. Okay. Multiplied by the regular or the normal corporate income tax of, uh, normal corporate income tax of 30%. Yan. Normal corporate income tax rate of 30%. So, 320,000 pesos times 30, um, 30%, 320,000 times 0.30. So, the normal corporate income tax for year 1 is 96,000 pesos. Gawin nyo rin yun sa year 2, year 3, year 4, year 5. And makukuha nyo yung mga no normal corporate income tax nila for um, the respective years of operation. So, for year 1, ang normal corporate income tax is 96,000. For year 2, 51,000. Year 3, 54,000. Year 4, 13,500. Year 5, 72,000 pesos. Now, consider the following example. Dito sabi natin, sa fourth year lang, from the start or commencement of operation, lang pwedeng i-apply ang MCIT. Okay? Sa so MCIT, again, you have to multiply the gross income by 2%. Dito, mag-start tayo sa year 4. Kasi nga, sabi natin, 4 years from commencement. 
Sa so year 4, ang normal corporate income tax is 13,500. Sa so MCIT, hanapin niyo yung gross income which is 970,000 mula dito sa year 4 multiplied by 2%, then you will get 19,400 which is higher, 19,400 or 13,500. Obviously, mas mataas yung 19,400, hence ang susundin niyo ay yung minimum corporate income tax rather than the normal corporate income tax. Punta tayo ng year 5. Sa year 5, ang net cor ang, ang normal corporate income tax ay 72,000. Punta tayo ng MCIT, 1,110,000 as the gross income for year 5 multiplied by 2%, then you will yield 22,200 pesos. Ano mas madaas, 72,000 or 22,200. Obviously, again, ang mas mataas ay ang normal corporate income tax. So, punta tayo dito sa baba. Itong 96,000, 51,000, 54,000, 19,400, at 72,500. Yan yung um, net uh, yung normal corporate income tax or the regular corporate income tax. Dito naman sa pinakababa, yan, yan yung mga income tax due payable. Okay? Bakit nakuha, bakit doon sa um, last na column may 5,900? Saan nakuha yan? Yung 5,900 nakuha from 19,400 uh, 19, which is the minimum corporate income tax for year 4, less 13,500. So, 19,400 minus 13,500, you will get 5,900. Yun yung excess ng MCIT over the normal corporate income tax. So, for year 1, ang um, kailangang bayarang tax is 96,000. Year 2, 51,000. Year 3, 54,000. Year 4, 31,500. Year 5, 66,100. MCIT year 4, 19,400. Normal corporate income tax for year 4 is 13,500. Then you will get 5,900 pesos as the excess MCIT over NCIT. As you can observe, the income tax payable in year 4 is the computed MCIT since it is higher than the NCIT. Sabi nga natin, you have to compare the MCIT and the NCIT and whichever is higher, yun ang babayaran nyo. Any excess of MCIT over NCIT can be carried forward as deduction to the normal income tax for 3 immediately succeeding taxable years. Any excess... Um, na MCIT shall be recorded in the books of the corporation as deferred charges MCIT under the asset section. The journal entry in the above example would be as follows. Okay. So, yan tayo. Year 4. Income tax ex expense is 13,500. Deferred charges MCIT is 5,900. Hence, the income tax payable is 19,400 which is yun nga yung MCIT at that time. Okay, for year 5, income tax expense is 72,000 pesos less the deferred charges MCIT. Yan yun, yung, yung hinigit na MCIT compared to the normal corporate income tax. So, the income tax payable for year 5 is 66,100. Bakit? Kasi kinary over natin doon yung excess na MCIT sa NCIT which is 5,900. Okay, 72,000 less 5,900 kaya nakuha natin yung 66,100 any amount of excess MCIT which has not or cannot be credited against normal income tax within the 3 year allowed period shall be close to retained earnings and can no longer be used as a charge against normal income tax the journal entry would be as follows so yan Retained earnings and deferred charges, MCIT. The MCIT is paid on an annual and quarterly basis. Same with the manner of paying the normal corporate income tax. So, relief from MCIT. The Secretary of Finance is authorized to suspend the MCIT on any corporation who suffers losses on account of prolonged labor dispute force majeure and legitimate business reverses. How about 
improperly accumulated earnings tax. So, in general, a tax of 10% is imposed on the improperly accumulated income for the purpose of avoiding the income tax with respect to its shareholders. The tax compels the corporations to declare dividends. And the inclusion is only domestic corporations and closely held corporations. Closely held corporations are those which uh, with at least 50% in value of the outstanding capital, um, capital stock or at least 50% of the total combined voting power of all classes of stock entitled to vote is owned directly or indirectly by or for not more than 20 individuals. What are the exempted corporations? So under the NIRC, the following are exempted from the application of this tax without qualification. Publicly held corporations, banks, and MBFIs, insurance companies. Under the RR2 2001, the following were added to the list with a proviso that the improperly accumulated earnings must be for reasonable needs of the business. The taxable partnerships, general professional partnerships, non-taxable joint ventures, and enterprises located within economic zones. So, IATI is taxable income adjusted by, ano ba yung IATI? Yan, improperly accumulated earnings tax. Improperly accumulated taxable income. Improperly accumulated taxable income is adjusted by Income exempt from tax, income excluded from tax, income subject to final income tax, and the amount of NOLCO deducted and reduced by the sum of dividends actually or constructively paid and income tax paid for the year. Evidence or purpose to avoid income tax. There are two instances which are to be considered. The fact that the company is a mere holding company or investment company, the fact that the earnings or profits of a corporation are permitted to accumulate beyond the reasonable needs of the, the business, the presence of either bringing suprema facie evidence of the purpose to avoid payment of this tax, the intention of the taxpayer at the time of accumulation is controlling to determine whether the profits are accumulated beyond the reasonable needs of the business. And lastly, the definiteness of plans coupled with actions taken, taken, taken towards its consummation are essential. Okay, for general professional partnerships. A GPP is a partnership formed by persons for the, sur uh, for the sole purpose of exercising their common profession, no part of income of which is derived from engaging in any trade or business. Any other partnership is liable for corporate income tax. A GPP may be exempted from corporate income tax if these two requisites are, are met. It is formed by persons for the, sole, uh, for the sole purpose of exercising their common profession without no part of the income of which is derived from engaging in any trade or business. If the GPP is exempt from corporate income tax, the share of each partner is subject to income tax. Each partner is liable in his separate and individual capacity. If the two requisites are absent, the partnership is deemed a corporation and is subject to corporate income tax. The share of each partner, whether actually or constructively received, is deemed as a dividend which is subject to final income tax. If there is other income but the income derived is passive, okay, example given is interest income which is subject to final income tax of 20%, Still, the partnership can be exempt from the corporate income tax. Passive income is not included in the partnership's annual return. For a joint venture under a service contract with the government, 
joint venture which is exempt from corporate income tax is a merger of two or more corporations for the purpose of engaging in construction projects or energy operations pursuant to a consortium agreement or a service contract with the government the corporations must be engaged in the same line of business it is only the joint venture which is exempt from corporate income ta um, income tax and not the income of each corporation from the joint venture thus each corporation is liable for corporate income tax for gocc's the net income tax is applicable to all GOCCs except the following. The SSS, okay, ano to? Uh, PhilHealth, uh, PCSO, and GSIS. All their exempt corporations. The following are exempt under um, Section 30 of the NIRC. Basahin nyo na lang yan ha. Labor and agricultural organizations not organized principally for profit, mutual savings, bank, beneficiary, society. Yan, pasahin nyo na lang yung section 30 of the NIRC. Yan, madami siya. Hindi tayo matatapos agad. Pag lahat yan, babasahin natin isa-isa. Um, also, I uh, provided you with a module for the income taxation. You have to read that. Uh kasama ito. So, basahin nyo yung inyong module at saka you have to watch this video. Parang ano eh, uh, rehash na lang ito doon sa mababasa nyo sa inyong mga module. Yan, napakadami nila. So, an exempt corporation can be held liable for corporate income tax if it derives income from any of their pro property or any of the activities conducted for profit regardless of the disposition made of such income above corporations are only exempt from income tax under section 30 but the same section does not bar the applicability of other taxes to these corporations and punta tayo ng gross income and exclusions so, Section 32 of the NIRC speaks of gross income and inclusion, um, exclusions. To arrive at the gross income, the exclusions must be deducted from all the income. Hence, the formula is all income less exclusions is equal to gross income. Gross income is defined by Section 32 quite broadly as all income derived from whatever source. This is an open-ended definition, suggestive of an intention to include, rather exclude, the following items, compromise the gross income, subject to income tax. So, the following items comp um, comprise the gross income subject to income tax. Number one is compensation for services in whatever form paid, including but not limited, to fees, salaries, wages, commissions, and similar items, except for the following. Those received by taxpayers who are subject to the gross income tax, those received by aliens employed by MNCs, OBUs, and petroleum service contractors, because their compensation are subject to the 15% final tax unless they choose to pay by way of final income tax. Okay, gross income derived from the conduct of trade or business or the exercise of a profession. Gains derived from dealings in property. If the real property is capital, the gain therefrom is subject to income tax and not included as gross income. If the real property is ordinary, it should be included. Interest income. Interest from loans are always included in the gross income. Interest from bank deposits are not included since they are subject to final income tax. Rental income. Royalties. The royalty is subject to final income tax if it is derived from sources within the Philippines. If the source is outside the Philippines, the net income tax is applicable. Dividends, annuities. Yeah. Prices and winnings. Incenses to be included in the gross income. It should be derived from sources within the Philippines and should be less than or equal to 10,000. 
The price is derived from sources without the Philippines. The taxpayer is a corporation. Okay. Pensions, unless exuded. Partners distributive share from the net income of the GPP. Ano ang exclusions sa so gross income? Okay, the exclusions, classes of income not included in the gross income. Passive income since this is already subject to final income tax. Incomes which are exempt under the income tax law. And income classified as exclusions under section 32B. Ayan pa. Ano yung fall, um, exclusions provided in section 32B of the NIRC? Yan yung list. Okay. Next ay ito. Dami yan. Sa retirement pay. Okay. Under RA 7641. Retiring employee is between 60 to 65 years old and he must have served the company for at least 5 years. According naman to RA 4917. The retiring employee must not be less than 50 years old. He must have been in the service for at least 10 years. The exemption must be availed only once and the private benefit plan must be approved by the BIR. The retirement pay given by GSIS, SSS, and PIVA are exempted from income tax without any qualification. Retirement gratuities, pensions, and other similar benefits given by foreign government agencies and other institutions, private or public to residents, non-resident citizens of the Philippines, or aliens who come to reside in the Philippines without any qualifications. Separation pay. They are exempted from income tax as long as the cost for separation from service is death, sickness, physical disability, or for any cost beyond the control of the employee. If from foreign government agencies and other institutions, tax exempt also. For terminal leave benefits, EO 291 provides that terminal leave benefits of government employees are exempt from tax. For private um, employees, if terminal leave benefits are paid upon retirement, such benefits are exempt from income tax. However, if given annually, okay, it is provided that if sick leave, it should not be exempt. If less than 10 days vacation leave, it should be exempt. And if more than 10 days vacation leave, subject to income tax. Yan, miscellaneous items. Yan, take note of those. Yeah.